mouth and you're straight up. After wandering through the desert for 40 years under Moses' leadership, the Israelites were finally ready to enter the Promised Land. And after what is surely one of the longest sermons in history, all of Deuteronomy, Moses makes his final appeal to Israel in this passage. Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20. Now listen, today I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep his commands, decrees and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you and the lands you're about to enter and occupy. But if your hearts turn away and you refuse to listen, and if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live a long, good life in the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today I have given you a choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you have made. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. For the word which brings life. Thanks be to God. For the tech which brings life. Thanks also to God. Great. So Paul didn't quite tell you how we actually reconnected after me being in Warnable for a number of years. So I was out walking with my 15 year old one dark night when this guy got out of a car, parked in the shadows and made a beeline for us. And so naturally I thought, a weirdo, oh help. And then a little voice called, Ellie? Ellie, is that you? And I realised it was your minister. (laughs) He said something like, oh, what are you doing here? It's been years, this is so weird, he says. Because I was thinking about you today, I'm planning a new sermon series and you came to mind. And I kept thinking you should preach, but I didn't even know if you're in Melbourne yet or how to get in touch with you. And I said something like, well, wow, okay, that's amazing and also weird. And uh, just be aware that whatever your series is, I won't mean to, but I will probably disrupt it. And so he rolled his eyes and we swapped numbers and we went our separate ways. And then my sleeping 15-year-old said, I'd like to think that was a coincidence, but yeah, probably not. (laughs) So I had a look at the material for this series, and then I had to tell your minister that yes, I will probably disrupt it. But Paul told me that you are a congregation that values relationship over being right, and that you enjoy hearing different points of view. And I jolly well hope he's right about that. So given how Paul and I connected in such a surprising way down in Parkville that dark night, and given your beautiful and very Baptist commitment to relationship over agreement, I will trust that the Holy Spirit is in our encounter today. So I'm here to offer a new relationship and also a different point of view, bringing a way of reading the Bible that is quite different to your current series. And my hope is that it will show you a way of engaging not just with the set text, but with what lies beneath and beyond any text in the Bible. And I also hope it might suggest where you might raise an eyebrow, where you might push back from time to time, so that you too can stand in this great biblical tradition of asking great questions and of reflecting on the context of the teller and the interpreter 
and the audience. The great biblical tradition of constantly unearthing new insights. There's always something new. And of learning to tell new God stories which are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. But as for how you receive what I have to offer, you can take it or leave it. It's up to you. But know that what I offer you, I offer prayerfully and with love and with a deep conviction that it is faithful to the good news in Jesus Christ. So let's begin. We've got God's big picture. So I'm not sure if it's just that I have a restless mind, the sort of mind that would go to study three years of theology because I wanted to find out if I was an atheist or not. <laughs> but when people tell me that the Bible has one single author, that is God, I do raise an eyebrow. And when they say that it has one single narrative arc pointing to Jesus, well, I think of my Jewish friends and I sigh. And when this way of reading just happens to justify violence and colonisation, I do feel quite suspicious. And if it also happens to reinforce the interpreter's location, where they are placed in the world, then this suspicion is fanned into a flame. And so suspicion is how I approach God's Big Picture series by Vaughan Roberts. In this series, we're told that the Bible is one connected story with one author God, and we are told that everything in Scripture points to Jesus and to his salvation. And so if this is true, that is all, if all the statements in the Bible are authored by God and they all point to Jesus, then we have to conclude that everything that happens in Numbers through Chronicles is God-ordained and God-blessed. Even the invasion of the land which is described in Joshua. Even the genocide of the local peoples. Even the slaughter of their animals. Apparently, this is all part of a single story and of God's big plan paving the way to Jesus. And I think about these things and I notice that we are told by a white Anglican priest and he's the rector of this beautiful old church in Oxford. And this church has recently been extended in a very costly and award-winning renovation. Obviously, both the church and the rector are part of the Church of England, and that's where the source of funding comes from. And the Church of England, a state church, continues to be funded through these vast reserves, which were accumulated through centuries of slavery and colonisation. As has been made so clear in the last few weeks at the Uruk Justice Commission, much of the wealth of the church, both here but also abroad and particularly in the UK, is grounded in stolen land, in stolen bodies, in stolen labour and stolen resources. And all the funds went back to England. And so for me, all this awareness sits in the background as Vaughan Roberts identifies the church with Israel. He erases the Jewishness of the scriptures. He erases the arguments within scripture. And he erases the effects of colonisation and even genocide on local people. Now, of course, we can gloss over all of this, and you'd think that I would on Mother's Day. Only we live in a country where many thousands of children were stolen from their mothers in the name of God and goodness. Many thousands of people still live with the scars of having been torn away from their family and their culture and their language and their land. And many thousands of people still can't sleep nights because of the harms they experienced as a result of these policies. And all of this was done in the name 
of the God of the British Empire, for its expansion and for its enrichment. And the wealth flowed back from the colonies all the way to England to build more beautiful buildings and to fatten already overflowing treasuries. So if Jesus truly is the salvation of the world, and never forget that salvation is simply a word which means liberation and freedom and healing. Salve, we can hear it in that word, like a salve then it becomes hard for me to agree with Roberts when he says that the conquest of Canaan was part of God's plan. Because conquest is the opposite of salvation. In fact, it creates the very conditions from which people need liberation, freedom and healing. That is, conquest causes enslavement, abuse and trauma. And these things have effects that run through generations. And so I profoundly disagree with the theology of this series. And I think with a little work, we can do better. And it's not that I don't have faith in Jesus Christ as the salvation of the world. I deeply trust in him. And that in him we will all know the liberation healing and reconciliation of all things. It's just that I think we do violence to the text and to real, actual people when we try to insist that everything in the Bible is part of God's plan and that everything points to Jesus. Because when we do this, we flatten the differences and the arguments within Scripture, we erase the Jewishness of the Scriptures and the last century showed us where that led. And we justify things which are incredibly harmful and which go against the witness of Jesus himself. So what do I mean by this, that it goes against the witness of Jesus? Well, it's often said that the Bible can be used to prove anything. Take a verse here and take a verse there and hey presto, women should be in the church and they should submit to their husbands. But take another couple of verses instead and ta-da, women are ministers. And they are co-workers in the gospel and they are apostles. So which is it? Which way do we choose? Or to take another example, you can use the Bible to argue that colonisation and even genocide are biblically sanctioned. And that is indeed how many European Christians justified what happened in this country. There are old sermons equating Aboriginal people with the Canaanites or Aboriginal people with the children of Ham and justifying colonisation of Australia on this basis because, of course, European Christians are Israel. Alternatively, you can use the Bible to argue that invasion, slavery, murder and theft are abominations to God and that repentance and restitution and justice-making are urgent tasks for the church. Again, which way do you go? Well, in order to make sense of this chaos that is the Bible, this beautiful chaos, we have to make choices every time we read. Because whenever we claim that something is biblical, we are usually ignoring or contradicting something else. The really inconvenient reality is there is no single reading. Every reading is an interpretation. But this doesn't mean that every reading is equally valid. Don't make that mistake. For followers of Jesus, our readings must be guided by him. This doesn't mean that everything in the Bible points to him. It does mean that we must approach everything in the Bible using Jesus' own methods while praying for the Holy Spirit to guide us. So I find permission to read this way from Jesus himself. In the Emmaus story, we have two disciples on the road who encounter a stranger. And this stranger opens their minds to the scriptures and, and sets their hearts burning within them. And eventually they realise they have encountered 
the risen Christ. But when you read the story carefully, you'll notice that this stranger, who is Christ, does not claim that every scripture points to him. Instead, and I quote from the Gospel according to Luke, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. These are key words, about himself. In other words, there are words in the scripture which are not about him. So as followers of Jesus, we would do well to notice this. And we would do well to think about how he and the gospel writers read some scripture and reinterpreted or even ignored others. To give an example, again from the gospel according to Luke, when Jesus begins his public ministry, he goes into the synagogue and there he unrolls the Isaiah scroll and interprets a passage to apply to himself, but he edits out a line about the coming day of God's vengeance. And this sets up his approach both to scripture and to life. It tells us that we too are free to interpret scriptures as it relates to Jesus. And we too are called to a life of non-retaliation and non-violence. Peace, I give you. That is Jesus' trademark. And to give another example of this, of Jesus' choices and what he chose to leave out, not once, not once does he quote from the most violent book of the Bible, the book of Judges. And the only thing he ever thought quoting, worth quoting from the book of Leviticus, was not the male-to-male gay thing, actually, but the commandment to love. That is the only thing he quoted from Leviticus. So as followers of Jesus, we don't need to insist that every bit of the Bible is equally valid. And we don't need to force every bit of the Bible into proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Instead, we bring his interpretive lens to scripture. And we let that guide our interpretation and guide our lives. So that's a lot of foregrounding, but you're going to need it. (laughs) And what does it mean for this unit in the series? Well, I'm not going to address all the content because Roberts makes his claims by picking out verses here and there from across hundreds of pages of scripture. And it would be like playing whack-a-mole, which is a fun game, but not what I'm going to do now. Instead, I'm just going to focus on the first half, which is the conquest of Canaan, and show how to to use this approach to to look at the text through the lens of Jesus. So two weeks ago, you looked, I gather, at the story of Abraham, later Abraham, and how God's people were called to be a blessing to the world. And yes, they were promised land. But how that comes about is really interesting. If you read onwards from Genesis chapter 12, it's not all sunshine and roses. Even so, you'll find stories of negotiation and of treaty and of purchase. And you will find a relatively peaceful settlement. But this week, however, the focus is on Numbers through Chronicles. And it's used to argue that conquest of Canaan was all part of God's plan in establishing God's kingdom. And as I said above, you can use the Bible to prove anything. But if you zoom out from the selected verses and have a look around, things get interesting. Abraham entered the land with conversation, with negotiation, with treaty. But Joshua takes a different approach. He announces that the land is under a holy curse. And then he declares that all men, all women, all children and all livestock must be slaughtered. Not one must be left to live. And that all valuables must be stolen and placed into God's treasury. In other words, Joshua enters with the extreme violence that we now call genocide. And if you were a Canaanite, if you 
were a Canaanite, then Israel does not look like the blessing to all nations as promised through Abraham. Instead, Israel looks like a freaking nightmare. Go to the land that I will show you, says God to Abraham. But will God give it? Or does Israel need to grab it? All peoples will be blessed on earth by you. But no mercy, says the God that we find in Joshua. The land is under a holy curse. And in God's name, everything and everyone must be killed. So which is it? Which way do we go? To answer these contradictions within our sacred texts, we must go beyond them and look to Jesus. And when we do so in Matthew chapter 15, we find a story about Jesus and a mother. How lovely on Mother's Day. This mother is a Canaanite woman. In other words, she is indigenous to the land. Her people have already experienced the invasion and genocide under Joshua. The survivors of that have been shoved to a very marginal existence on their own land. And her daughter is deeply, deeply disturbed. And so she looks to a person with resource to help her. And that person is Jesus. Jesus, whose name is actually Joshua. Because we read a Bible which is written by different people over many generations in several languages. And that then passed through other languages to get to us who speak English. So Jesus is the English version of a Greek version of a Hebrew name. And that Hebrew name we call Joshua. But when it passes to us through the Greek, we go, Joshua, Jesus, Jesus. Joshua, it's the same name. And you might like to think it's a coincidence, but yeah, probably not. So in this story, a Canaanite mother reaches out to Joshua, Jesus. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, she cries, my daughter is tormented by a demon. And he didn't answer her at all. Maybe he was thinking, I'm from one of the oldest families. I'm a son of Abraham from the tribe of Judah, descended from King David himself. I share a name with our great General Joshua. And maybe he was thinking, this is a promised land. We've been here since forever. And with that, he effectively erased tens of thousands of years of continuous Canaanite culture and dismissed this woman from his awareness. But she persisted. And his disciples came and urged him, send her away for she keeps shouting after us. And he replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he still wasn't even talking directly to her. Maybe he was confused or offended by her demand. Because he knew that his namesake had carried out a holy war against people just like her. And he knew that this was justified in Torah. As it's written in Deuteronomy, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations, and when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. Again, our sacred text, how do we interpret it? He knew that hundreds of years earlier, his namesake had tried to fulfill this. 
enter, drive out and destroy. Show no mercy. And yet here was this woman very much alive, forcing herself into his consciousness as she shouted and demanded mercy. And she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And the reason most scholars think this is a genuine story is because it's so offensive. We want Jesus to be infinitely compassionate, infinitely kind. But maybe that's the Jesus at the end of the story because he's not quite there yet. Instead, he threw a gut punch. He said it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. In Mark's version, she's a Syrophoenician woman, the Yorta Yorta woman perhaps, or the Wurundjeri woman. But Matthew uses what was by then already an anachronism, an old word, the Canaanite woman. He's reminding a very Jewish audience exactly who she is in their history. Someone who should be driven out and destroyed and shown no mercy. Someone who tempts Israel to forsake their God. Someone for whom no true blue Israelite ever has compassion or a kind word. Dog, he called her. And she said, yes, Lord, whatever. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In other words, yes, master, but who exactly made me a dog who took my land, who took my language, who made my daughter's life a living hell? Who keeps me poor? Who keeps me dependent? Who afflicts my daughter with demons? You're the master. You have power. Just look what your people have done. And in that moment, in that moment, Joshua Jesus changed and he healed her daughter. Salvation in Jesus' name, it means liberation. It means freedom. And it also means healing. Healing for the woman's daughter, but also maybe for Jesus' own heart. He was always growing in wisdom and stature. Because in that moment he changed and then he stayed in the Gentile region for some time and great crowds came to him and he lavished God's healing upon them and they were amazed and they praised the God of Israel because of this healing. And when he fed this hungry crowd, there were seven baskets left over, seven signals, seven Gentile nations that Joshua had once sought to destroy. Those of us who remember our Sunday school lesson might remember that there were two picnics, not one. And in the first, there were 12 baskets left, one for each tribe of Israel, shaped by his ancestry, culturally conditioned. My bread, it's only for Israel, he said. Dog, he'd said. 12 baskets. But changed by his encounter with the Canaanite mother, now he found plenty for everyone. Now he found 12 baskets, uh, seven baskets, enough for the Gentile nations. So that leaves us with a question. Joshua or Abraham? Genocide or treaty? Conquest or vulnerability? No mercy or a picnic where there's enough food for everyone? Which is the way of Jesus and which way do you choose? You can use the Bible to prove anything, but our way must always be the way of Jesus. And as I keep saying, salvation is a word which means liberation and freedom and healing. And the God made known in Jesus Christ rejects domination, 
rejects enslavement and rejects all violence. He doesn't cause trauma. He comes to heal it. And so this is why I reject a series that claims that the conquest of Canaan was all part of God's plan leading to Jesus' salvation because it's incompatible with the God made known in Jesus Christ himself. Instead, perhaps I would say that the author of Joshua was convinced that it was God's plan and so made these claims. And these claims were very convenient to nation building. I might also say that the teller of the story was only one author in a many authored collection of texts. And that our interpretations must be guided by the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And that means that we must always seek the word which is truthful, which is life-giving, which is loving, which is non-violent, and which is above all ultimately healing to the most marginal person in a room. And in our context on Mother's Day, this means people who were stolen from their mothers. This means families who were broken. This means all those people who are victim survivors of violence, which all too often means mothers and girlfriends and daughters. So these are my guiding lights as I read the Bible not as a detective novel laced with clues as to the mystery of the Messiah. We are convinced that Jesus is a Messiah. That is why we're here to worship and praise his name. There's no single narrative. There's no one theology. Instead, we have been gifted with this curated collection of stories and sermons and poems and histories and prayers Proverbs and everything else for us to wrestle with. This collection is diverse because it was written by passionate people over many generations in different contexts and this led them to have different points of view. And it's hospitable. It's a welcoming collection of stories and texts because the authors trusted their audience to enter into the conversation and to find those readings which are faithful, the readings which bring life and liberation and healing to the most vulnerable people in our society, the readings which are a blessing in which make us a blessing to all people. Joshua, he justifies violent conquest and sadly, so does the proof texting habits of the big picture series. But I place my faith in a bigger picture, where through engaging with the text, through seeking the life-giving reading, and even like Jesus did with the Canaanite woman, occasionally changing our minds, we will encounter the living word. We will know and encounter the living word. So as Jesus' disciples, let us always, always, always reject violence in our readings and in our lives. And let us instead open ourselves up to dialogue. And let us listen carefully to those strangers we encounter on the road and invite them to our table. Because all too often it is the stranger, the Indigenous mother, the marginalised person, the victim of the world's violence. It's these people who can open our eyes afresh to the scriptures and set our hearts burning within us. So will you join me in a word of prayer? God of love and freedom, you set before us the way of life and the way of death. And you ask us to choose. At every crossroads, Lord, give us clarity. 
Help us choose wisely. And help us choose boldly the way which leads only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the salvation of the world. Amen. Amen. I'm